Hello, everyone. I'm Susan Nash, AAPG, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to Pivoting Number Eight, and it's um, Learning from Other Industries, Geothermal Machine Learning and Smart Completions. We have a great program today, and I'd like to thank our special sponsor, very generous sponsor for the entire series, Aramco Services, and I'm really excited about that. So I'd like to go ahead and, and turn, <laughs> turn the, the floor over to our president, Rick Fritz. Thanks, and, Susan. Hello. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to another pivoting series. I love these, and we thank Susan for uh, putting those together, but all, but uh, thank thank everyone for speaking. It's uh, very important. I'm not going to take uh, much time here. It is my column is coming out right now, which I know all of you read uh, religiously, and uh, especially Julian. I can see him shaking his head. I uh, it's about innovation this time, and Susan is the uh, actually uh, the head of innovation at uh, at APG, so it's appropriate. One of my favorite, uh, uh, I was looking, I, I love quotes and it is said that uh, necessity is the mother of all invention, but I, so I put another quote. I don't know that I made it up, but I, I didn't see it anywhere else, but I really think failure is the father of most innovation uh, because that's, that's often what it takes to, uh, and, and we're in the middle of that right now, APG is with, uh, with the uh, financial issues and uh, COVID and uh, geopolitics and all that. So a lot of failures out there and we're reconstructing ourselves. So uh, this is all part of it. So with that, I'll turn it back to, uh, to Susan and I look forward to the, to the talks today. Thank you. Well, thank you. So I'd like everybody to take a look at this, the agenda today. You can see we have a packed agenda. So I'm going to um, have our leadership speak a bit, but I'd also like to to point to you, point you to the theme, which is geothermal, but is also machine learning, and, and and automation. So they all come together in creating really amazing opportunities. So I'd like to to welcome Ursula Hamas, uh, Energy Minerals Division President, to say a few words. Thanks so much, Susan, for having me at the exciting uh, Pivot series again. I always look forward to this Wednesday evening series. Thank you so much. I cool. welcome everyone um, for, for this Pivot series. And some of that is actually part of uh, EMD because we have a, quite a big EMD group, um, geothermal and a lot of other different uh, uh, energy mineral related uh, uh, committees and groups. I would like you to check out the EMD website sometimes. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel and I wanted to just highlight that uh, just today we had a Zoom um, webinar highlighting a free software for freelancers. It was a free webinar and it's going to be available at, uh, on, at the EMD uh, Zoom, uh, at the EMD YouTube channel. Let me know if you a link or um, I think it's, it's a really good. You can just Google EMD YouTube and you will get there, I'm sure. Um, well, that's great. And you can also put the link in the chat. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I will do that after the introduction. And then I also wanted to uh, point out uh, our geothermal committee chairs, Bruce Cutright, and uh, he and Justin, uh, and several other of the co uh, EMD committee members are thinking about uh, uh, having a, a geothermal wor workshop that will also incorporate um, people from the government, uh, regulators, hopefully to get more funding for this kind of business. And last but not least, I wanted to advertise the ACE 2021 that is going to be in conjunction with the SEG in uh, end of September in Denver. And we're going to have a fantastic program that we're working out together with SEG that will incorporate not just the geology, but also the geophysics of energy minerals. With that, I don't want to take anything away from uh, the next uh, speaker and from those amazing discussions and uh, presentations. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Well, thank you. 
So our next step, uh, I'd like just to, to um, welcome um, Julian Chenin from our sustainability committee, just to say a few words, and then we'll turn to the program. Hi, thanks again, Susan. Uh, I really appreciate you having us on the call today and also for, as usual, putting together a fantastic program. Uh, for a little bit of background about the Sustainable Development Podcast for everyone online, what our purpose is is to communicate broadly the positive technical economic, environmental, as well as social benefits of the petroleum industry, as well as its collective efforts towards sustainable development. So we're, we really comprise of a diverse group of people, not just from industry, but also academia, and how we can actively incorporate that, not just in our everyday practices, but also prepare our students for what I'm going to quote Rick Fritz, because I also like quotes, uh, the energy integration right as we start moving forward uh, a few little keynotes that i wanted to point out we are very excited uh, to also be presenting at ace we have an entire sustainable development panel uh, the title is from petroleum industry to energy industry sharing global perspectives on an energy uh, on a sustainable future and we'll be working closely with the world petroleum council so it'll really be a global perspective and discussion Finally, we also have our AAPG Sustainable Development Podcast. If you guys haven't checked that out, we usually put out monthly episodes and we have different guests come on talking about what sustainable development means to them and what geos can actively do in that space and how those all relate to each other. So again, thank you so much, Susan. And if I don't want to take too much time from the speakers, but in case uh, Dr. Faber had anything to say from the DPA committee, feel free to jump in and thank you again. Really look forward to this session. Thank you. Oh, great. So um, Dr. Faber from DPA is here. She didn't put her on the program because it was a maybe, <laughs> but I'm so glad she's here. Thanks, Susan and Julian. Happy to be here and very excited about this evening's topic. Um, just a few notes for, uh, for me at DPA. Uh, I think that this is an excellent topic to discuss just on the grounds that uh, we're diversifying in terms of oil and gas and in terms of business. And so having alternatives uh, to explore in terms of uh, sustainable energy sources is exactly the kind of business that DPA is looking into. Um, I also want to draw your attention to a recently announced uh, webinar that Aramco is also sponsoring through the AAPG Stimulating Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Group, which is uh, Mitigating Cognitive Bias. And I'll go ahead and pop that in the chat uh, in a minute here. But it's a uh, we partnered with uh, leadership leader uh, Michelle Ann, who will be taking, taking a, us through a becoming more skilled leader and learning an on-the-spot bias and experiment with tools to mitigate biases. So it should be a very interesting session and we're very thankful for Ramco for sponsoring that as we're trying to get further into integrating DEI into our initiatives. Thanks very much. Great. So one of the things that makes tonight really unique is that we have a real life um, geothermal lease that needs to be evaluated. So as we hear all the experts speak, we'll, we'll have Sean Marshall and Danny, Danny Reg from Criterion talk about geothermal lease evaluation. And then thanks to a collaboration platform uh, through um, Srathis, we will have the opportunity to put the information there. So then you can log in and try your hand at evaluating the um, reservoir. So it's kind of a, a combination of theory and application. So I'd like to, to welcome our first speaker, John Holbrook, who's a, a TCU professor and expert in many things. One of them is geothermal. So I'd like to, I'll go ahead and, and stop sharing so you can share your screen, John. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, so I need to push share screen. Oh. So what do you need me to do, Susan? Um, let's see, make, uh, did I make you a co-host? Do you want to share a screen or, or do you want to? I need to share a screen, yeah. Okay, you can just share it. I've made you a co-host. So oh, okay. Yeah, so just... Um, good, 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 good. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, okay. All right, can everybody see my screen now? Good. I, think that, I don't think that you're sharing the actual PowerPoint. You're sharing the directory. Excuse me? I think you need to open the PowerPoint and then reshare so you can okay. share the, the actual PowerPoint. Okay. 
Sorry for the delay. That's okay. Oh, here we are. Uh, there we go. Great. Working now? Um, yes. Yay. Got it? Yes. All right. <clears throat> okay, well, first off, thank you all very much for inviting me. I'm happy to share some of the things that we've done. First off, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, John Holbrook. I'm a professor at Texas Christian University, and my role in geothermal is largely cheerleader, uh, but uh, I was the coordinator for the SED HEAT program, which was meant, which was an NSF-funded research coordination network, which was designed for the purpose of trying to find, exceed the challenges for making geothermal economical and practical. And so this is largely a group of academic people uh, assisted with industry and government people trying to literally look this over. I was chief cook and bottle water of it. Uh, but there were about 300 people involved, and I had a se steering committee involving most of the people who are kind of the uh, heavily involved people in geothermal in the country and in the world. So here's where we went. First off, just uh, kind of get the concept straight for everybody about what we're doing. Simply, the idea for harvesting geothermal in deep, ba deep sedimentary basins at this point or any place else is simply a matter of your classic injection well, harvest the heat extract the water, take the heat, turn it into electricity, pump it down the line and make toast. So one of the things that's been put out as this notion that uh, the economics is about uh, half a barrel per second at about 150 degrees C to make profitability for geothermal. That's a debatable point, but just as a benchmark, let me throw it out there to let you know what people are thinking. Okay, so from all this work, what did we learn? OK, well, a lot of us sitting around and talking about this topic and having several meetings on the on the topic and lots of presentations and lots of papers and lots of work came to a few observations. Here's a first obvious one that I think everybody is pretty well aware of now is if you look at where most of the power, most of the energy is used on the globe, well over half of it at this point in time is used in the poor nations, what we largely call developing countries. And looking into the future, almost all the exponential growth in this is going to be in the in those countries as well. So we have the first issue with any sort of solution to addressing uh, addressing carbon low uh, power sources means it's got to be reliable and it's got to be economic for them. It ends up being relatively irrelevant what we do unless that we can address their problems. So geothermal as part of that mix right now is not projected to be a very large part of that plan. So obviously we need to change that if we're going to invoke, if we're going to use geothermal in the future. Okay, so what are the advantages of geothermal? Well, we saw that in uh, very uh, clear terms in recent times is this country runs on base load. You have to have a steady power grid that's always relaying power. The way I always describe it, instead of visioning power as a can of something that you open up and take a little out, picture it as a river going by where you ladle a little out of it as you need it. But the discharge has to remain the same no matter what. So you have to have steady sources of supply of energy, which wind and solar obviously don't do, but geothermal does. So it's base load plus it's base load on demand. You can ramp it up and you can lower it down, which allows you to compensate for other energy sources to keep the power grid stable. Okay, the other thing is we've got a lot of heat out there and we've got a lot of sedimentary base. So in terms of the entire resource, it's estimated at about 100,000 exajoules of of actual heat energy that is in sedimentary basins in the United in the lower 48. So for perspective, the entire United States uses about 100 exajoules a year of power. So it's about a thousand years worth of energy as the resource base. Okay, so why aren't we doing this already? Uh, well, the main finding, of course, is, is that most sedimentary basins are operating at heat levels that are just on the boundary of economic for most traditional geothermal plans. So the heat's just a little bit low, so you need to be a little more creative to be able to harvest it. So it's low, it's low enthalpy, but you've got lots and lots of it, and, it's, and it isn't so low that you can't use it. So 
what I've kind of summed up here is there's really sort of three areas I see as the opportunities in for the petroleum industry for working and getting into geothermal. First off is just direct heat mining, just pump the water in, get the heat, pump it out, use it. And so traditional geothermal systems use flash, uh, use dry steam or flash stream power, which means that you're using extremely hot water and you're turning turbines directly with the water pulled out of the ground. Most of the newer technology is in the low heat challenger here. That's the Rankin cycle, Rankin, Rankin cycle generators. They use a binary system where you pump the hot water through a heat exchanger, which heats an organic fluid of some kind. And then it turns that into steam. And so you can actually harvest much lower heat. So instead of having to deal with these kinds of heat levels to generate geothermal, you can work down in here where sedimentary basins actually operate. So our first advantage is, is technology has moved forward on the gener power generation turbine front tremendously. And it's gotten us to a place where we actually have some potential to have turbines that will actually do the job. And so the way I jokingly put this when we were working, started this about seven years ago to where we've, where we've got to in the last couple of years is for geotherm, we've gotten from maybe for dollars to certainly for pennies. And so a lot of that has been advancements in engineering that has allowed us to use the heat we have. <clears throat> so bottom line there is we have millions, literally millions of oil wells across the country that have the kind of heat resource that would actually work in these low heat enthalpy systems. And I was just informed Saints Geosystems is moving forward on one of these reclaimed wells at the moment. Okay, second area of opportunity we have is industrial scale space heating. How's that work? Well, first off, if you look at where we heat buildings and cool and we heat water and where we spend a lot of our energy, it's already at the temperatures that you get from sedimentary basin geothermal. Matter of fact, if you look at our electricity usage, somewhere around half, half to just below or just above of all commercial uh, and household energy use of electricity is in heating things. And so this principle is being used pretty heavily in households to just run shallow geothermal and heat pumps. That can be upscaled to deep basin to run large municipalities and large institutional systems. So various groups here like the Indiana Geological Survey has been working on that concept. Essentially, the idea there is electron saved is an electron earned. So if you want to generate, if you can heat places with direct heat from the ground, then you don't have to spend electricity to do it. And then here's the last thing I want to talk about. This is a big thing, and this is really sort of the next big innovation that we have and the area where we have a lot of potential to expand. That's energy storage. As a, geothermal systems is an energy storage system, or what we'd call the earth battery. Okay, the idea here is fairly simple. You pump heated water into the ground, store heat, and then you pump it out later. So the logic behind this is that if you have, say, a, say existing oil wells, or you may drill new ones, you have access to underground aquifers. So the heat already in most of these is about 200 degrees Fahrenheit or so anyway, when the water is extracted. And you, if you were to take a solar thermal system like this central tower system, and you take that excess heat energy and you put it, the heat into the water before you inject it, you inject it into the ground and you now heat that water up and you spike it. And so you can raise it say 150 degrees Fahrenheit easily. And now you're pumping 350 degree Fahrenheit water out of the ground that you have stored where you stored excess solar heat prior. That doesn't just double the energy that you have. That actually is an ex as a seven and a half fold increase in extractable heat energy. So you can store enormous amounts of heat in the ground. And these towers are able to heat up to upwards towards nine degrees Celsius on a good sunny day. So you can heat, the idea here is, the, is heat, the, uh, heat the water, put it in the ground, then draw it out later when you need it. So far, there's no, there is no energy plant in the country or if I'm aware of in the world that's actually doing this at this moment. There are some plants like the Stillwater plant here where they are coupling geothermal and solar plants, but what they're doing is they're taking low enthalpy 
geothermal waters and they're heating it extra with the thermal solar heat before they run it through the generators to sort of top it off. But they're still bound with the idea of they work when the sun is shining. Okay, so why is energy storage important? Well, this is why. This is, uh, that we've talked to California Power about this already a little bit, but the idea is this, is they're moving towards uh, move, putting a lot of solar energy on the grid. They've put quite a bit already and projecting to put more. So what that has done for them is it's done this, is generated something that we uh, like to call the duck curve in the business um, because it's shaped like a duck. The orange line reflects the actual energy in energy usage of electricity. That's the amount of base load you have to keep up no matter what or your computers start to start to have surges and so forth. The green line reflects the non-solar energy sources. These are the base normal base load effects. So what's happening is the sun comes up in the morning around eight o'clock, you start getting a big solar surge. You have to lower the output from the other energy sources to keep the power grid stable. The effect though, is by the time you get in the evening about five or six, when the sun starts to come down, you are faced with about a 12 gigawatt in the four hour period ramp up right now. They're looking at as much as by the time this is done, as much as 35 gigawatts of power. For perspective, that's about 35 nuclear power plants. You can't just turn on a nuclear power plant. So the way they're dealing with this right now is they're compensating for the loss of solar renewables by using natural gas on you know jet engine on a concrete slab and imports of energy for other places. Obviously, the bottom line of it is, is that right now you're not gaining a whole lot from that solar because you're having to turn right around and use other energy sources to, to, to recoup and get things back up to power source. So it's, it's depleting from the overall benefit of this. So that plan that they're working on right now is they're looking at buying batteries. So they've contracted with Tesla. Last time I talked to them, they contracted for about a gigawatt scale battery. This is one of their smaller batteries, only 100 megawatts down in South Australia. So the idea is you, st sell, you store the solar uh, energy in a battery. That's got limitations. Batteries only get so big. So what we're offering is a simpler idea, is use the ground. So basically a typical injection well is about 100 degrees C. Top it off about 50 degrees C get it up to the economic levels of geothermal power and pump that as hot water into the ground, spike it with solar energy during the daytime, store it in the ground, then extract it. So you're using the geothermal system as the actual base load power system, but you're charging the battery, heat battery in the ground with solar. Okay, the effect of that is you end up with solar base load by coupling solar and geothermal systems. So it's an idea. The NSF has funded our group. Uh, this is actually John McLennan. He's actually, he's at the University of Utah. Him and his group actually got the grant and did the work and they ran some preliminary numbers to try to test and see if this idea has any merit. Here's what they came up with. This was just their meeting, just, the, the, just about less than a year ago. Uh, so they designed several different formats of producer wells and injection wells systems that would actually be able to operate, produce these, produce a viable geothermal battery system. And they ran some preliminary efforts to uh, do rate checks, to do models to see how the earth should respond. And what they found was very encouraging that as you run the models of heat energy storage, after about a hundred cycles, which means a hundred days of pump and injection, they get to a place where the heat energy model heat energy storage is getting back to about 95% recovery. In other words, almost 100% of the energy you're putting into the ground, you're able to extract later during the next cycle as actual baseload energy in the geothermal system, making you have a viable geothermal system in a system that's normally probably a little too low in heat by simply spiking that heat a little bit before that you pull it in and running that as a coupled geothermal system. Okay, so one thing I'd like to close with is I just wanna call your attention to this. This is a bill. This is uh, Bobby Guerrero, he's the 41st, 41st district uh, representative of Texas and has proposed this bill 
This bill has presently just been released and sent to the comment period yesterday. So this, would, uh, this particular bill would allow the Railroad Commission to couple with private industry and to provide funds to develop new geothermal plants in a, part, in, a, in a Texas government private industry partnership. So if you have some opinions on this, this is where you can find it. You can add some comments. So basically where it goes at this point, I think as a geologic group, this is where we are. This is what we're good at. We're good at injection wells and extraction wells. We, this, this fits our skill set. And it's new ideas. It's got some potential. So at this point, this is our green opening. So let's give it a try. Right. That's great. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. That's wonderful. And, and I, I think that it sets the stage perfectly because we, it gives us a nice um, overview. So I'd like to invite Ahmad Ghassemi from the University of Oklahoma to share his screen. Um, you might need to stop sharing, John. <laughs> and to talk about what he's doing at the University of Oklahoma. Hi, thank you. You're uh, welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, great. Uh, just give me one minute so I can get my, uh, my PowerPoint here from one computer to another. <laughs> and I'll share my screen just now. <laughs> So after um, Dr. Gossemi uh, speaks, we'll have what we'll have is Sean Marshall and Danny Reg of Criterion, who have recently acquired a lease, a geothermal lease in Utah. And so they will just show what, where it is, what it is, briefly just uh, say what, what it is that inspired them to, to um, acquire it. And then in the Srathus collaboration platform, and I'm hoping that Rekha Patel puts a link to Srathus in the chat box, then people can go there and get more information and, and collaborate. I think I'm ready. Okay, good. Okay. All right, good evening. And thanks Hello. again for the invitation. And I've just put a few slides together to uh, uh, kind of uh, provide an overview of some of the uh, challenges uh, and opportunities that uh, uh, we encounter with the uh, high grade or uh, unconventional uh, geothermal resources. And uh, that is usually known as EGS or uh, enhanced geothermal systems. You know, I like to call them unconventionals and that will be I'm apparent uh, in the next few slides. Uh, before we uh, uh, proceed, I'd like to uh, uh, kind of recall what uh, a good geothermal resource uh, uh, is. And uh, in many ways, uh, the way we answer this question is similar to uh, uh, we would answer, you know, what makes a good petroleum reservoir. In a way, we need a reservoir to begin with that has a seal and the rocks that contain the resource, in this case heat, should uh, be permeable and have sufficient porosity. They should be hot, obviously, uh, larger than 150 degrees C these days. And uh, uh, at the same time, there should be plenty of water available. Now, either uh, naturally, that is, there should be some kind of a recharge taking place, or uh, there should be water nearby that one can inject and circulate. Uh, and in general, the current uh, estimates indicate that we need about 50 uh, uh, kilograms per second to generate uh, around five megawatts uh, electric uh, per well. And that's actually a very large volume of water. I mean, if you compare that uh, roughly 30,000 barrels per day, you know, uh, there aren't that many oil wells that produce at that uh, rate anymore these days. So, uh, so we're talking about large quantities of water. It's doable. Uh, for EGS, uh, the uh, current uh, understanding is that uh, to make it really commercial and, and viable, we need temperatures of say 175 to 200. Uh, higher temperatures, of course, are more desirable, but there are significant technical challenges when you go uh, beyond 220 to 25. 
the enhanced geothermal systems typically are characterized by their very low perm values. Uh, in fact, uh, it used to be called the hot dry rock uh, concept. And the idea is we would drill probably one or two, three wells uh, and create at least a duplet with two wells, uh, hydraulically stimulate one or both wells and generate some kind of a fractional network that uh, we can circulate uh, water at uh, sufficient rates to generate electricity. And so uh, if you look at the map uh, of the US, uh, there are significant enhanced geothermal type resources on the west side, uh, but the deeper you go, the brighter the picture uh, gets. And you can see that uh, uh, central, west central US, uh, uh, south Texas, northern Louisiana, uh, they, they provide uh, some decent uh, temperatures and uh, potentially if one could go to 5K, the uh, uh, resource would, uh, quality would increase even more. And at six uh, kilometers, obviously, you could probably have EGS systems uh, uh, in the eastern part of the country as well. But of course, the deeper you go, the more challenging the, uh, uh, the creation of a reservoir uh, becomes. So... Um, uh, there are similarities. Uh, we can learn uh, from the uh, unconventional petroleum resources and how they were developed uh, when we uh, think about enhanced geothermal systems. Both of these resources occur in very low permeability rocks, as I said, and so we need to engineer a reservoir. Uh, very much uh, similar to the situation with unconventional oil and gas. Uh, there are more challenges, I would say, in the uh, a geothermal sector because uh, the resource is not going to come to you. So in a, in a petroleum reservoir, you uh, fracture the rock and so you create flow pathways and, and so uh, you know the, the gas or oil flows into the well bore. Uh, in this case, uh, you have to uh, bring the cold water and bring it into contact with sufficient uh, rock volume so that you can generate uh, heat. And so that requires a very significant uh, uh, level of uh, creating new surfaces, new fractures uh, in, the, uh, in the reservoir. And so uh, the idea of one or two planar fractures would not uh, be satisfactory. Uh, we need hundreds of fractures, uh, preferably uh, fracture networks uh, and not just planar features. Now there is some debate within the EGS community, uh, whether planar features or pseudo planar features can work. Uh, theoretically they work, but there are issues with respect to sh short circuiting and other aspects of uh, reservoir management that uh, one has to uh, uh, consider. So uh, here's a cartoon of, of you know, the a classical kind of conventional thinking about the um, enhanced geothermal system. Uh, you have an injection well somewhere in the middle that connects with some kind of a uh, uh, reservoir that either is uh, consisting of pre-existing natural fractures in conjunction with newly created hydraulic fractures or uh, multiple hydraulic fractures created from scratch. Uh, other conceptual models were called for reactivating pre-existing rock features, discontinuities such as uh, natural fractures and uh, other kinds of you know, uh, small scale features that would uh, coalesce and create uh, a, a large volume of broken rock essentially. Uh, so uh, it is possible to do this with two wells. Uh, the cost of drilling obviously is high. Uh, uh, each uh, well uh, would cost somewhere along, you know, uh, around two, $2 million, you could say, uh, depending on the uh, particular economics of the day. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not a cheap, uh, cheap project. Uh, technical uh, challenges in terms of reservoir cre creation, uh, the nature of the stimulated volume, uh, that is not readily understood. Uh, we need to understand the plumbing of the reservoir because water losses obviously are detrimental to the operations. Uh, we need to understand how the fractures that we create interact with pre-existing ones. And, and so uh, that would help us engineer a uh, uh, reservoir in a more effective fashion. And uh, understanding the dynamics of com complex fracture networks uh, in response to cooling, uh, chemical dissolution, precipitation issues. Uh, all of those are uh, uh, significant challenges to reservoir management. And uh, finally, induced seismicity. 
So uh, just like uh, unconventional oil and gas, we, we can run into induced seismicity when developing uh, enhanced geothermal systems. Uh, but uh, again, uh, there are, uh, uh, there, there have been uh, uh, DOE sponsors projects that have uh, been successful uh, creating additional energy using the EGS concept. Currently there is the Forge, uh, Utah Forge, uh, uh, essentially a geothermal laboratory that uh, aims to uh, uh, provide an opportunity and in situ essentially field uh, lab so that we can test ideas and uh, carry out research to help uh, overcome some of the challenges of uh, developing the EGS systems. And uh, with one more slide, I'll end my uh, presentation or at two slides possibly, I don't wanna go over. Uh, the uh, technical challenges with respect to actual technology of managing the reservoir include uh, zonal isolation, uh, not only for creating fractures, but also for controlling flow. It is possible that when you create these fractures that we have short circuiting. And so we would like to shut off the valve and not produce cold water. Uh, induced seismicity I already mentioned, uh, one more uh, idea along the lines of EGS is supercritical EGS. And this is uh, uh, gaining uh, acceptance uh, uh, internationally and within the US. Uh, uh, and I think Japan probably is uh, leading the efforts in this area and hopefully in the US uh, uh, it will get, gain more traction. Uh, there is, I know, uh, ultra -right energy uh, uh, working on this concept. Uh, the idea is to drill to depths of uh, 15,000 feet or more. Uh, the temperatures there are about 350 to 500 degrees C. Uh, of course, this makes uh, drilling and uh, installing casing, hydraulic fracturing, everything else far more challenging. But uh, the prize is that uh, one well can produce uh, as little as or as low as 25 uh, megawatt electric. So that's uh, five times a typical EGS, uh, EGS uh, well. And so uh, this is, uh, this, this was really, really a, a uh, uh, huge success if uh, uh, we were able to uh, uh, target and reach uh, these kinds of resources. And uh, with that, I'll end it. Thank you very much. And uh, if there are any questions or comments, I'll be happy uh, to discuss. Thank you. Really appreciate that. So I'm just going to go back to our um, program really quickly and, and introduce Sean Marshall and Danny Rigg really quickly, who will be um, who will be talking about their lease. They won't speak very much, but just briefly to introduce the concept, and then we'll follow it up in Srathis and over the next few weeks. And I'd also like to thank on our other sponsor, Geophysical Insights, and of course I'd like to. Thanks, Sarathis, for being a collaboration platform uh, provider. So thank you. And welcome, Danny and Sean. Yeah, hey, everybody. Hopefully you can see our screen uh, up there. Can I get a thumbs up, yes. maybe, Susan? Great. Yes, it looks beautiful. Awesome. Yes, beautiful, beautiful outcrop uh, on the page there. And uh, we are Criterion Energy Partners. Uh, we're a geothermal energy company, uh, very, very early stage. Uh, we're focused on independent exploration and power production uh, from geothermal energy. Uh, we're, we're focused on developing geothermal energy projects to provide clean, renewable baseload power using heat from the earth, as, uh, as you all have, have heard about uh, from the previous speakers. So uh, presentation is going to include uh, lots and lots of maps and pictures. So uh, I'm going to try to be really quick and, and not spend too much time on these slides. But uh, what you're looking at here is, is sort of a, uh, you know, a pseudo heat map of all the, the uh, favorable geothermal uh, areas, kind of the western and uh, part of the, the United States. And Utah's right there in the middle. And I think the previous uh, speaker uh, mentioned Utah Forge. And Utah Forge is kind of highlighted on the map, and you can see the existing geothermal uh, sites in the western part of the country, uh, highlighted by those those little little circles. So uh, we are in Beaver County, uh, or the the uh, Utah Forge site is in Beaver County, and uh, on the right hand 
uh, bottom right hand side of the of the image here, you'll see uh, some some green outlines of tracks that were that were put up for a lease sale by uh, the BLM back in uh, the fourth quarter of last year, and uh, we uh, decided to participate in that lease sale and acquired a lease. So I'm going to speak a little bit more specifically about that. So uh, there were really kind of three AO, well, uh, maybe four AOIs, uh, groupings of, of tracks that were, were put up uh, for auction. And we, uh, we looked at all of them and evaluated each opportunity for various subsurface and, and surface uh, advantages. And uh, the, the prospect number one right here is, is uh, near, uh, very near the Utah Forge site. And, and actually just south of, of the Utah Forge project is where all these tracks sit in this prospect one grouping. So zooming in on that prospect a little bit closer, you can see uh, there is an existing uh, geothermal power plant, the Blundell plant, and uh, it's in the Roosevelt uh, geothermal field. So there's some shallower conventional hydrothermal uh, production in that area. And then the DOE forge site is is the deeper uh, EGS system that uh, that's been talked about. And so uh, this is just another snapshot of those leases overlaid with some topography and uh, the favorability from a, a temperature standpoint. So then this is this is actually a, uh, a snapshot of, of the lease in particular that we picked up. Uh, Geo 30 is what I like to call it uh, today. And it's just due west of uh, the, the small town of, of Milford in uh, Beaver County. So what I've done here is overlaid the outline. Hopefully you can see that okay. I know there's a, a lot of detail in this, this image, uh, but you know, effectively you're looking at uh, an isotherm outline contour here and an overlay of, of our lease tract. And as you can see, the, the isotherms actually get cut off right as they go into our tract because the edge of the DOE study area is, is actually uh, right at the start of our leases. So uh, DOE Forge has some fantastic data sets on their website. I highly encourage you to go out there and take a look at what's available. Uh, they have an interactive earth model that's that's uh, that's published and uh, and live. So uh, these are just a couple of snapshots of that earth model. Some of the the uh, surfaces that are included, the granitic basement and and the uh, isotherm layers. And uh, just again to kind of highlight, you know, this is this is the, the extent of the Earth model, and our our tracks are just south of the edge of this this Earth model. So, as you might imagine, Sean and I are interested in extending the uh, the study uh, further to to the south of, of the existing data set. So, um, just to conclude, I want to want to thank you and invite you to reach out to us if you're interested in solving uh, the quest to solve energy. And uh, I think Rekha is gonna talk about the platform in which we're gonna host this geothermal lease evaluation challenge. And, and I'll go ahead and let her do that now. Um, well, we'll talk about the platform last. I think we want to keep this um, with the geothermal right now. So we'll just, people will just go to the, the link that's in the chat for now. You got it, yeah. too. no problem. <laughs> thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you, this is great. So and I'm excited about our next speaker, uh, Dr. Christine Pankow, because she is actually in Utah, and I think she works with the Forge. That's correct. So, um, I need to be able to share my screen. Yeah, Danny, would you mind um, stopping the share? Yeah, perfect. Great, thanks. Okay, great. So hopefully you can see it. Yes. Great, thanks. Hi, I'm uh, Christine Panko. I'm the Associate Director of the University of Utah Seismograph Stations in Utah. I'm also a research professor of geophysics. Um, so thank you uh, for the invitation to come chat with you. I'm gonna keep up the topic of FORGE because that's my, where I am involved with geothermal and at the end maybe share some broader thoughts uh, regarding 
seismic monitoring and geothermal, and we can pick that up more in the discussion. Um, so we've already been introduced to FORGE. Um, it's uh, a site located um, southwest of Salt Lake City, a couple hundred miles. And this is a Department of Energy um, project to enable the research um, to make a commercial pathway to EGS. So we've been, there's many people on the team. John McLennan was mentioned earlier. He's uh, working on drilling. We've got modelers. Um, so the, it's, a, it's a very large project so trying to look at all the different aspects of um, bringing EGS to commercial pathways. So what, what's happening at Forge um, is we are drilling two wells. So the first well is now complete. It's called 16A. So you can think of that as the blue well here. Um, it's going down to about 10,000 feet. So close to around three kilometers in that range. You can see we're getting into that 200 degree C temperatures that were mentioned earlier. And this well was completed end of December, early January. And um, our plan is this well will be stimulated uh, late summer. Um, and at, then at that point in time, after additional research, uh, the second well will be drilled. Um, and along the way, um, I'm on the Utah Forge team. So we're part of the project team, but there's also been um, research proposals put out for other teams to come in to propose different projects um, for at, at Forge. Um, and there'll, there'll be more of these RFPs in the, as we go forward. Uh, so here's a, a snapshot looking down at Forge. You can see the yellow uh, rectangle out there is where the new 16A um, well is. But we have a number of other wells. So starting the discussion of seismic monitoring, we do seismic monitoring at geothermal for, for two purposes. Um, one is for reservoir development. So it was mentioned earlier, sort of the issue of fractures and where the fractures are growing and how to connect the two wells. So we really need to have a good sense of how the fractures are propagating, in what directions, if we can get a sense of source type or these sort of shearing or thermoelastic type uh, features. That's kind of what we're looking at. And so to do that, we have to have um, really close um, uh, seismic monitoring. So we've put in this uh, uh, network here, 5832 was our pilot well, and that will be instrumented for um, with geophones going forward. And it's at about one and a half kilometers. 5632 was drilled um, just this year and it goes down to its case to about 2.7 kilometers. At 7832, um, it's only a thousand uh, kilometers deep, um, but it has a DAS cable in it already and it will also be instrumented with geophones and we will be drilling a second well on that same pad um, that goes almost to three kilometers. It will have DAS uh, cable in it down to two and a half um, kilometers in the cased section. In addition to that, we have a number of shallow boreholes, one of which is shown here, 6832. Um, and so it's closer to 300 meters and it has uh, a geophone and an accelerometer in the bottom. And it's a permanent installation, so it's recording and telemetry data in real time. So one of the aspects of seismic monitoring is probably similar to what happens in oil and gas. You need a, a sophisticated network for targeted at the types of seismic um, events you might see. So in this case, this particular part of the network is focused on that reservoir development. Um, but similar to oil and gas, We've had larger um, events induced in geothermal, uh, most recently the Pohang event in Korea, um, which was, a, I believe, a 4.8, 4.9 uh, magnitude event. Um, and those have given geothermal, um, it's been tough for geothermal because you have Pohang, you have Basel. And so this is one of the reasons that induced seismicity 
is uh, such a big challenge here is we need to find a way to monitor the seismicity in such a way that we can um, adjust production um, to, ch to change the seismic activity. So what's in this map is our surface network. So this is more for hazard. Um, so we have a number of shallow boreholes. These go down 30 meters or so, and that's FSB1, FSB2, and FSB3. And those instruments have uh, broadband and accelerometer sensors in them, and they are installed. We will be putting in FSB4, five and six early summer, and these will go down slightly deeper. These will go down about 40 meters and be instrumented with uh, broadband sensors. On the surface, we have um, FOR1 down south of Milford, um, FOR5, 6, 7, and 8, and these are spread out because we want to be able to control epicentral locations as well as hypocentral locations. So we need to for the larger events. So these, this is more the magnitude zero and larger seismicity. That network of boreholes that I showed in the previous slide is uh, for the negative magnitude events. So this is a type of network we've been designing. What we're hoping to do is collect more data. And one of the research targets here is, is a traffic light system. So these have been around for a while and this summer we'll be just using a very traditional traffic light system that will be based on magnitude and, and numbers of events. But one of the sort of exciting areas of research in my opinion regarding um, induced seismicity and geothermal and, and other projects is these things called adaptive traffic light systems. So once we get a sense for how the reservoir develops where the seismicity goes, we might be able to constrain the seismicity and look for changes in more of the long-term patterns um, that could be used um, to adjust production. These have been played with some in Europe, um, but it's still um, in, in development. Um, for those of you who want to know more about FORGE, uh, this is our website. Uh, seismic data is available there. The link to the the data dashboard and, and those models that were shown in the previous slide, all of it can be accessed from this site. And with that, I will say thank you. Wonderful, oh, that's really great. And I, I really appreciate the fact that we're looking at the role of geophysics in geothermal as well. So our, our next um, uh, presenter is Dan Taranik. Would you like to share your, your screen? Sure. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. We see your desktop. There we go. Great. Well, thank you. Um, my name is Dan Taranik, Managing Director of Exploration Mapping Group, and I'd like to thank Susan and Rick for the opportunity to present here today. Um, my talk is entitled An Incomplete History of Thermal Infrared Satellite Imagery for Geologic Mapping and Exploration. So I'll be reviewing briefly the uh, uh, remote sensing, um, mostly satellite approaches to exploration and mapping for geothermal and other geoscientific um, features from satellite imagery. Uh, the infrared was discovered in 1800 uh, by William Herschel in the UK. There is a series of optical and electronic uh, developments that led to the current mercury cadmium telluride area rays that we use in space uh, and airborne instrumentation to detect geothermal or thermal signatures. Um, I won't go through these all, but uh, you'll have them here if you want to look in the recording. Uh, the focus on geoscientific applications of the thermal infrared really started with the world's uh, first Earth-looking satellites, weather satellites, and in particular, a scientist named uh, Ron Lyon at Stanford University, who showed this uh, chart from laboratory spectrometers, how um, felsic rocks to um, ultra basic rocks, mafic rocks, um, have quite a predictable shift in their wavelength uh, regions and quite a few diagnostic crenulations in those absorption features. Uh, scientists with NASA, JPL, and Kale uh, was in an aircraft doing other measurements and she turned on the Daedalus airborne scanner that had previously not 
yielded any significant results, but after uh, some processing and this fortuitous uh, switching on the instrument, they ended up with a cover on Geology magazine in 1980. So that exciting discovery led to an aircraft uh, precursor to a spaceborne instrument called TIMS, the Thermal Infrared Multispectral Scanner. And Anne and uh, Alex Getz ended up with another cover uh, showing thermal infrared satellite, uh, or sorry, aircraft measurements in Death Valley. There uh, was parallel during that time, uh, a satellite called the Heat Capacity Mapping Mission that produced some significant uh, geologic mapping results uh, in the thermal infrared. And that was followed by the fairly spectacular CBAS airborne instrument with 256 channels uh, only in the thermal infrared. And you can see the detail with which it's mapping uh, geology and some specific mineral phases. So with that history uh, behind us, uh, by way of background, um, we have uh, at least four uh, satellites that either have um, broad global um, availability and archives developed, or they're currently uh, orbiting and producing data right now. Those are Aster, AVHRR, EcoStress, and Sentinel-3. And then I'll briefly mention to close some of the TIR satellites that are actually being built, not on the drawing board, but actually uh, coming quite soon. So starting with Aster, uh, this uh, began as a research and development effort between the US and Japanese governments in 1999. It was never really meant to see the light of day for broader geoscientific use, but it was so popular because of the broad range of rocks and minerals you could map in the thermal infrared in the eight to 12 micrometer uh, wavelength region and all the different minerals uh, you could map in the shortwave infrared as well. So that was quite exciting. And uh, we now have a global archive of some eight years available uh, all over the world. This is just one example of the Aster thermal infrared signature. And you can see here how uh, we're mapping uh, geology and rock types based on uh, the restoration features, the absorption features we looked at from the start. And we're getting really good geologic discrimination that you can't see uh, this kind of detail in other wavelength regions. Uh, the another satellite um, called ABHRR uh, started orbiting in 1978, and we're now on ABHRR uh, version three, and that's been orbiting almost as long as the Landsat series of satellites. So um, uh, clever scientists in Australia have been able to map paleo channels using the thermal infrared data, and uh, you can see here, for example, how they've used the thermal infrared data along with surface, uh, sorry, airborne geophysics to map the different uh, paleo channel um, versus bedrock versus quaternary cover, uh, cover units. Uh, Vicky Stimoulis in 2006, in, also in Australia, used ASTER data and uh, compared it with ABHRR and was able to find that the ASTER data could actually map uh, some areas of prospective uh, uranium occurrence. And although AVHRR was quite useful and showed some discrete anomalies, you get far better uh, detail in the Aster nighttime thermal. So you're basically looking at flat topography and all the uh, grayscale um, uh, white and dark areas are, are representing paleo channels that are differentially cooling. Um, moving up to more modern instruments, the EcoStress system was launched by NASA JPL in 2018. Uh, it was the cheapest satellite uh, NASA ever launched at less than $30 million. And it was built by a team that was headed by a person named Simon Hook, who is a geologist who's worked with NASA most of his career. So, of course, in addition to the environmental applications, of the satellite, evapotranspiration and water use efficiency, they were able to map um, uh, some very good uh, differences in the thermal infrared uh, in recent years using the land surface temperature measurements. Um, a center of excellence in the world, uh, um, there's uh, the EcoStress uh, science team also includes international researchers. So Chris Hecker at ITC, uh, University of 20 in Delft, the Netherlands has a GeoHot uh, project that's actually mapping geothermal response. 
And here you can see the uh, um, heat source response at three different times during the same day. So that's quite exciting. And then they're involved in research now showing geothermal anomalies in the blue polygons with fum known fumaroles in red and power plants in the yellow. Um, last instrument slide is uh, Sentinel-3. And um, basically geoscientists have modeled uh, the asthenosphere lithosphere boundary called the LAB and have found that 85% of the world's base metal deposits, nickel, copper, zinc, et cetera, are found uh, within the margin of these lab boundaries. But currently the lab is only mapped using seismic tomography from base stations 250 kilometers apart. So Sentinel-3 definitely has the potential to more accurately define and map that boundary and uh, prove as an exploration tool. So uh, in my last slide, uh, just a few uh, future science, thermal infrared uh, uh, commercial efforts and government efforts. The Trishna um, launching in 2025 is a French Indian satellite effort. Surface biology and geology by NASA will launch in 2027. The ESA has Sentinel-8 uh, launching in 2028. And all of these have uh, a number of thermal bands that'll be useful for us in geosciences, geothermal detection, as well as rock type uh, mapping and differentiation. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Let me know if you'd like to follow up on anything. I appreciate it. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you. So that, that was very informative and very useful. So our, um, our last speaker is actually going to be giving a, a preview of her speaker or her speech next week. So Deborah Sakri is um, going to give a talk next week on, on May 5th on basically how she's used a numerical methods and analytics to find new discoveries. So um, I'm going to put in uh, a link in the chat box so you can sign up for it. It's May 5th, it's at noon, it's one hour. To, and she's doing it in, as a part of the deep learning technical interest group that APG has. And that's chaired by Patrick Ng, who happens to be here um, tonight. So Deborah, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, let me just share real quick. Um, so what, what I'm planning on doing next week, I, had a, I have a, a presentation where I'm showing using machine learning in um, using SOM classification to show both uh, an unconventional reservoir and how you can calculate reserves in unconventional reservoirs, as well as this reservoir I was going to show tonight, which is East Texas. And basically, I'll be showing how I can look at the geology, how I can go into machine learning and, and look at the um, neurons or the, the patterns that are there and associate those patterns um, by extracting them along the well bores and looking at them with log curves. And I can see before production and after depletion, and then going in doing a statistical calculation uh, by various statistics to prove that those neurons are actually part of the reservoir. And then after that, I can go into, the, into um, a calculation of volumetrics based on geobodies and come up with something for people to drill. So I'm using this to go into old fields find new exploration targets that have been left behind and, and find the economics. I'll be doing this both on the unconventional and the conventional resources, and that'll be next week. Thank you, Susan. Oh, that's great. Great overview, that's wonderful. Um, this is such a great, great evening tonight. So many great topics and, and insights. So we always like to finish up with our technical presentations with our technical showcase. And we have a Canadian company tonight, and uh, it's uh, Cold Bore Technologies, Lee Payne. And uh, Deborah, would you like to stop sharing so Lee can share?
How do I stop sharing? Oh, there we go. I did it for you. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> Excellent. Well, as you mentioned, um, yes, we are headquartered in uh, Calgary, but we are uh, scattered across the U.S. I am actually in the Houston area, uh, so I get to enjoy the hot weather and not the uh, cold winters as my uh, coworkers up in Canada get to. Um, so I appreciate y'all having us on, uh, getting us uh, and to talk a little bit about SmartPad and completions in general. A um, little bit different from what we've heard over the last few presentations, um, but certainly something cutting edge and new. Um, so a couple of years ago, we created SmartPad, which is the first on-site completions master control system. Um, kind of a fancy way of saying that we network every um, control system that's currently on a frac site. So the old way, and, and a lot of times the current way um, that you see uh, completions happen today is you have multiple services out there, um, you know, sometimes six different services, and they all have um, six different data sets. Oh, shoot. Everybody see my screen all right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, perfect. And so they typically have um, six different data sets. And so what that creates is an extremely difficult time to try to tie all those six data sets back in together to get a true um, to the second auditable timeline um, view of the operation. And so what happened in, in the past was operators would typically look at each service in a silo. So wireline, you know, they would look at wireline times, they would look at uh, frac, they would look at water transfer, sand, every other service. And it was basically just on their own. Um, the more advanced operators would try to tie them together, but they, they had competing timestamps even at that point. So what we um, realized and noticed was this huge void in understanding of the data that was on location. So we created a um, dashboard, a completion master control system where we actually uh, place um, sensors on the existing frac trees. Um, these sensors are valve positioning sensors and pressure transducers. And it basically through an algorithm allows us to auto detect the various operations that are occurring on site. So, um, everything is down to the second. So to that second, you then have all your services kind of stitched uh, all together. So you have frac wireline, you know, pump down, uh, pressure relief valve, sand, chemicals, water transfer. Every, every service and digital output that you have is now to a common timestamp to a second. Um, this allows you to have that full 100, you know, 360 degree look on location. And where that is helpful is if completions was ever going to get to an automated state, and be able to build out logic and pull some of the human decisions out of the operation to increase efficiencies, effectiveness, and safety, you had to have this common timestamp. So what we're doing now, um, and we've done several times, and, and it's still a, uh, <clears throat> I'm kind of skipping around a little bit, is uh, automate uh, valve control with certain um, wellhead providers and also get to um, continuous pumping. And so when you look at frac, it's a high dollar, high expense um, service on location. And really what operators in, in the industry is, is working towards is more efficiencies, greater effectiveness in getting off site um, in, in record time, cutting those days of operating down. And so like a prime example was one of our clients last year had a six pad program and through the ability through SmartPad and viewing this data and looking at different efficiencies, they actually cut 15 days of operating time off their entire operation by being able to ensure that every second was fully utilized on location. So kind of, and it's, it's a 50,000 foot view. <laughs> so our dashboard is bringing in all of the data that's on location. So. This is kind of a broad overview, but you can actually view in real time all of the FRAC data that's coming in from the FRAC service companies. The critical path, which is this is based upon our algorithms and auto detect. This is what's tying everything to the second. So all of these time blocks give you the ability to look through your operation in real time and identify gaps or areas that need to be addressed to increase your efficiencies wireline and pump down on a screen together. This is instrumental in looking at wireline efficiency is kind of a, a, a forgotten service out there sometimes when it comes to efficiency and effectiveness. So the ability to have pump down a wireline on one screen where you're looking at your pump down versus your 
all your wireline data gives you the ability to go back and check and see if you know you had a wireline event that uh, perhaps resulted in, in uh, you know pulling out of the rope socket an early set plug a plug that didn't set you can go and try to piece together the problem and fix it so that it doesn't happen further down the line and then this top right corner right here is our well pad view and so this gives the operator the ability to view his valve positions in real time um, anywhere in the world that he has internet access. Uh, this has been instrumental in, in uh, getting that, that more transparency of what is happening on location and really great uh, adoption during, during COVID as uh, people were trying to separate a little bit more and um, travel was shut down, but operations were ongoing. Um, an engineer could be sitting at his home working from his house and, and actually log in and see which valve is open, how much pressure was on it, what stage the operation was actually occurring at that moment. And then obviously it correlates back to the entire picture. <clears throat> and then with all of this knowledge, it comes back to how we utilize it. And so there is a reduction of carbon um, component of it where you're able to look at those efficiencies. And once you start reducing days on location and optimizing the, the entire operation, you're able to control commodities. Um, you know, you're able to, to limit the use of, of water, uh, diesel, uh, natural gas. If you're if you're on uh, fuel technologies, um, you know, you're, you're, all of your commodities are able to be actually monitored much more effectively. And once you start bringing those unable to frack times into smaller windows, and you expand your frack time, you're actually going to get off that pad sooner. Which is, which is a greater reduction in, in your actual ex, uh, exposure. <clears throat> and here's another kind of a zoomed in picture of kind of the, the critical path. And this is what is the engine that's driving automation and completions. Um, this bi-directional communication we'll have with frack wireline um, wellhead and us, and we'd be the, we are the network in the center of all of this. Um, it all it all is evolving around this one second timeline. So in a conventional, you know, standard operator recording method, typically there would only be three events that which would be recorded into a manual time log, a fully encompassing wireline, a well swap, and then a frack. This well swap, what we found out over time is kind of a catch all bucket for a little bit of everything on location. Um, whether it's equipment maintenance, it's waiting on, you know, one service or another. Typically, it might not get recorded in this, and this even wasn't down to the second. It was typically recorded in either five-minute or one-minute increments. When you come over to our SmartPad Coldmore high-resolution timeline, there's 10 events that are recorded, and so you actually can break down your wireline run-in hole and pull out of hole, the standby time where they may have been waiting on frack, the bleed off, the stab off, waiting on wireline, and then back on frack, you see prime up pumps, uh, pressure test equalize and then the frack job. These are all events that actually are done to the second. And when you, so when you look at an entire pad as a, as a whole, instead of individual operations, you start to really look at it from a almost a refinery or industrial type perspective of an operation and starting to close the gaps of, of inefficient time. And as frack, you know, uh, you know oil prices and, and, and gas prices have fluctuated the name of the game moving forward and how people are able to actually shrink their, their completion spend is to be more efficient and look at that actual, you know, every dollar spent to ensure that you're using it wisely. The, you know, prior to kind of the data surge of, of interest in the, or in, the, in the industry, people would just kind of chalk it up of, oh, it'll be all right, we'll catch up tomorrow. But that's not really how it happens anymore. So having this, and it's a kind of a, a, uh, everybody, you know, the tide rises all boats type perspective, because even the service companies are involved in this and this visibility that they're actually receiving is helping them improve their business. But it's, the longer they're on location, typically it's also um, negatively impacting their margins as well. <clears throat> and then of course, um, on the backside, when you have all this data, you start building out some analytics um, and we do custom analytics, talk to our clients, see what really they're wanting to look at because um, when you start automating the data flow from location into, into the cloud and then into their internal databases, they're typically on the back end running it through different systems to, to examine the data. And, and so what we're able to do since we have all of this data filtering into a single 
uh, platform is actually build out um, analytics that makes sense for the operator. Um, my background was frack operations. So this is all information I probably would have killed for back in the day because I did a lot of this painstakingly by hand. And unfortunately, um, when you have to do that, you have to make a lot of assumptions. And so your data is only as good as the assumptions that you make. So by automating this and running it through all the different channels that we have, you're able to actually get that full, you know, auditable timeline, accurate assessment of your pet. So try to keep it a little short and sweet for y'all. Thank you. And that was great. And, you know, I like the fact that we're going through things quickly because then if people want more, more information, they know where to go and can get more in-depth and detailed information. So now we have a few minutes left for um, questions and answers. And I think that there have been some in the chat, um, but I'd like to, to go ahead and, and maybe have, um, since we had John um, talking at the first, just like what exactly John Holbrook after seeing all the different presentations, uh, what do you see as just like a one nanosecond insight that you would like to share? Well, I think that the main thing that I would see in this is that what I, is that one, I find the geothermal community is one of the most enthusiastic bunch of people so you people you will ever meet. And there's this has been one of those things that has been advancing along the way. And I'm what I'm seeing in a lot of this is we're actually seeing some advancements that are bringing it right to the levels of profitability. So I think that the big observation of this is, is that we're hitting a technological threshold where that we're ready to try to you do some uh, we're ready to try to do some experimental and implementation of some of these newer ideas and some like some of the deep, you know, EGS and some of the sedimentary basin stuff and actually see if we can get some companies involved in investing and just giving it a shot. Well, that's great. And um, Dr. Gassemi, I have a question too. And this is kind of one that came up. Yes. So there, you require a lot, it requires a lot of injected water. So, can that be recycled in a closed system and it can it be um, produced water? Uh, produced water? <laughs> well, it, it, good idea. Uh, so th there are issues with, with that. We have to uh, consider the, the produced water. Uh, uh, two issues. Uh, of course, anytime you, you extract and re-inject back uh, somewhere else, uh, potentially, you know, there's, there's risk of changing the stresses and, and maybe uh, seismicity uh, comes into the picture. And the other component is um, uh, dissolved solids may uh, react with the rock and, and damage permeability. So if that aspect of it can be managed, that's not, a, not an issue. And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, uh, maybe uh, I noticed Pat Dobson was online, maybe you can correct me, but I think, uh, uh, in California, they are taking uh, some of the uh, 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 sewage that is, has been uh, processed and pumping it back into a geothermal reservoir, if I'm not mistaken. So, so I mean, the idea is, uh, yeah, so Pat Dobson uh, is there, he can, can address that. So, so, that, so that idea, yeah, I mean, it has uh, merit. And so, uh, yeah, the, the, the uh, water rock interaction needs to be considered. So just following up on Am Ahmad said, this is Pat Thompson. They're pumping uh, through two different pipelines, one from Lake County, another one from Santa Rosa, approximately 20 million gallons of treated wastewater a day for reinjection to recharge the geysers geothermal field in Northern California. Thank you. Yes, that's that's what I was. Uh, I, I could not remember the, the names. <laughs> yes. Talking about uh, so, dissolved solids affecting the reservoir. Back when I was working geothermal in the Imperial Valley, California, we had uh, the Salton Sea or Nylon field, and it was basically brine. And mm -hmm. uh, Shell had uh, extracted some water, and they had a basin. Uh, or a lagoon, a line lagoon, and uh, 
schools would go out and collect the uh, the, uh, the salt, crystallize, and make little desk things to sell uh, for projects. But we had, I forget what, but it was basically brine. And our problem was when we pumped it back down into the reservoir, pressure gradually increased. And we used various methods to try to get the solids out. One of the uh, things fell with head magma power, BC McCabe came up with a large metal box filled with iron filings and or iron shavings and would pump the brine in one side and bring it out the other. And uh, for some success, I have some pieces of uh, uh, iron filings on my uh, shelf with minute Kalina crystals uh, growing in it, but they eventually started extracting this with uh, uh, stuff you'd use in uh, uh, sewage treatment plants. And they would take the solids and haul them off to San Diego for a, a toxic waste dump. But that was quite a problem with, uh, with uh, the Imperial Valley. Anyway, that's my input. <laughs> I think the, also the Imperial Valley now is uh, there's a big lithium mining, uh, lithium potential from some of that uh, water that comes to surface. Yes. Yeah, there uh, people have been trying to extract stuff from this brine since I was there in, in the late 70s. Uh, some were successful, some not so much. Cerro, Cerro Prieto over in Mexico. Uh, they were extracting uh, potassium for fertilizer. They uh, were drying this stuff and bagging it. Uh, anyway, lots of efforts to get stuff out. Uh, so I have a couple of quick interesting uh, comments and questions. One is about how difficult it was to get the geothermal leases. I think that's for um, Sean and Danny. <laughs> Oh, so actually, I uh, I commented in the uh, the chat on that a little bit. Um, so it depends on where you are uh, to answer that question plainly. Um, in Texas, it's undecided if it's uh, the surface owner or the mineral owner. So the recommendation is to kind of lease both. Um, but in our example, we lease BLM land, so that is all owned by the federal government. So it makes it kind of easy um, in terms of who you have to deal with with regard to mineral rights. Excellent. And then I think um, Robert Gales is commenting um, about some different things. Do you want to say anything? Uh, I haven't seen that comment. If you have it off. Well, he just said he had it. There was a good question on steam flood fields, elevated resi resi residual heat that de last decades. And then the other comment was a good way to um, avoid. It was actually a question from uh, uh, Alan, yes. or Malcolm Allen, that yes. uh, talked about the steam flood. So I think that's a good question, uh, Malcolm. Right. If I can address that for a moment. Um, lots of, at least in California, also up in uh, Alberta, there's lots of steam floods, which eventually are going to be abandoned. Uh, those steam floods are 30 years, 20 years in the making. An awful lot of heat has been applied to the ground, uh, trapped within the reservoirs, hundreds of wells to thousands of wells available already. The ownership of the mineral rights is known. Uh, the infrastructure for uh, power uh, delivery is probably pretty easy in that you know there's a lot of power lines going into the field that are no longer used. Power can just be, electrical power can now go out of the fields. Uh, seems like uh, a good opportunity for low temperature, low risk geothermal. And from what I've read in the literature, uh, that seems to be the trend now is, is uh, low temperature geothermal, at least in Europe. Uh, so many abandoned coal mines, uh, you know, underneath cities, drill, you know, a few thousand feet deep, just uh, 
you don't need much of a temperature change uh, to be able to generate power. Mm -hmm. Huh. And so going to all the expense and energy required for fracking, which I sadly is a, is a no-no, going to be a no-no. Uh, we hope not, of course, in California. But um, when you've already got the wells in the ground, uh, abandonment costs are going to start rearing their ugly head. And you've got all that heat in the ground. It'll stay there for another 100 years if you don't do something with it. Really just, just, to, just to add a couple other comments that Malcolm is the other advantage when you start looking at a steam flood is the water tends to be a extremely fresh that comes in it just because of the quality of the steam went into condensation and all right. I can comment one other thing from a project I actually worked on in California we were looking at reservoirs that the steam flood had actually stopped in the mid 80s so what are we at now? This was in 2015 or so. We were still seeing elevated downhole conditions that were 20 to 25 degrees F over the surrounding rock. So it takes a long time to dissipate that heat once you get the mass heated. That's incredibly insulating. And, and one thing that, um, well, and I'd like to, to ask um, Christine Hankel a quick question too. So regarding induced seismicity in oil and gas um, injection wells, the, the idea is to, to balance the load so that they, there aren't uh, too many, the, the stress fields are not completely imbalanced. Is the same concept applied in, in geothermal? It's largely the same process. Um, I guess I, I'm not as familiar with what you're talking about in sort of oil and gas production. So where things are going with adaptive traffic-like systems and such are, would speak to that some because they'll be guided from something called the B value, which is a proxy for stress. And so there's research into that and how that might be used, but I don't know that it's actually fully developed at this point in time. Okay, great. Well, we've come to the end of our time and it's sad because <laughs> it's such a wonderful conversation, but um, we can always please keep up the, the conversation in the Serapis um, collaboration platform. I'd like to thank Aramco Services for being our, our um, series sponsor and also for Geophysical Insights and Serapis for being um, sponsors as well. And like to remind everyone that you'll be getting an email from me that has a link to the recording and I encourage you to share it and also encourage you to, to be in touch to find out about more uh, events and I'd like to turn the, the, the uh, floor over to Rick Fritz. Well thank you again everyone for your uh, presentations and for Susan for putting this together. You know, they say behind every innovation is a great story. And I think uh, we've heard some great stories tonight. Look forward to uh, hearing more. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, everyone. Really thrilled and appreciate everything. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. 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 Thank you.